you're here in the room, another easy way to do that is just go to PursuitChurch.life and click on the Give button, and you can make your safe, easy donation that way. But we want to encourage you to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. Give to the mission of reaching uh, and, and seeing so many people here in Prattville and beyond be able to find Jesus. You get to be a part of that mission, and you get to be obedient to our Heavenly Father when we do that. So that's what this is all about, and I would encourage you to continue to support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. And the third thing that I want to tell you about is there's something that's coming up one week from today. Can anybody in the room tell me what it is since we're a small group here today? Good, good. Prayer and worship night. I hope you get a little more excited about it in the next week. Prayer and worship night. We, we committed ourselves to doing six of these throughout this year because we want to make prayer an emphasis of what we're doing this year and, and how we're going to reach people. And so uh, this Sunday night, I want you to come at six, not this Sunday night, like a week from, don't show up tonight, but like a week from tonight at 6 p.m., uh, be here. It's going to be real simple, just a time to be able to sing a little, pray a lot, and and really pray for our community, for those around us who desperately need Jesus. Come with a heavy heart, prepared to be able to pray for those around us, and it's going to be an incredible night. And that happens how many weeks from tonight? One from tonight, July 31st, at what time? 6 p.m. You're all over it. All right, let's, let's pray together, and we're going to continue in worship. Father, thank you so much for who you are, for everything that you do for us. God, we don't want to take these moments for granted that we get to be in your presence. And so over the next few minutes as we, as we worship, over the next few minutes as we take some time to open your word together, Father, I pray that you would speak into our lives. God, that you would meet us directly where we are. And God, that you would reveal to us something that, maybe something that needs to change, maybe something that needs to be transformed by you. Maybe, God, you would reveal to us a new direction. Maybe that you would reveal to us a something that we've never heard before that changes the way that we think that that brings transformation to our hearts and souls now we know that your word is powerful enough to do that and so we ask that you would do that and that that we wouldn't just hear it and it be something that goes in one ear and out the other instead that we would receive it and it would it would really transform us god we pray for those who would love to be here today but they're sick they're hurting we have some who have COVID, some who have other sicknesses as well. God, we just pray that you would bring physical healing. God, that you would help them to sense your presence and your peace. And God, we pray that you would use this church. God, we, we believe with all of our hearts that you have placed us here to be a light in this community, to be a place where people could find Jesus and it would be life-changing for them. We pray that you would use us. We pray that you would send us people who desperately, desperately need to hear about your grace and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you, can, if you are able, stand with us. We're going to continue to sing and worship together this morning.
Father God, in this place this morning, we love you. We thank you and we glorify your name. Lord, speak to us as we sing this song.
As we stop and reflect on that promise that we just sang about, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that comes from a chapter that we're going to read here in a little while together that comes with a lot of other promises about how incredible our God is and that if He is for us, there is no one that can be against us. And so as we continue to sing this one last song together, I just want you to remember that promise this morning as we sing.
Thanks so much for singing with us. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. You better enjoy that theme music while you can. It's going away soon. So um, we are in week seven of a series called When in Rome. And in this series, we have been looking through the book of Romans, which was written by a guy named Paul, making sure you're with me here in this first service, uh, written by a guy named Paul. And he wrote it as a letter to a church in Rome because that church was beginning to fracture, to splinter a little bit because they were coming from all these different backgrounds and they were trying to figure out how to believe and live out this new thing that Christianity was. And so Paul said, I'm going to write a letter that unites them all under the umbrella of Jesus together. And now we come to chapter eight, which is considered by many to be the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. Now, I might lean a little bit more towards Luke chapter 15 personally, but this one is right up there. Certainly the point in Romans that if you were like writing the soundtrack to the movie based on the book of Romans, this is when you would start like playing the Rocky theme song because this is when he like starts turning the... Qu Have you ever seen the movie Rocky? Okay, you know the music? Okay, good, because you all just look confused. It's a movie, and this is when they would start doing that music because this is where Paul is going to really begin to challenge us to do something. So far, what he's been talking about is like all this incredible stuff about Jesus, how we relate to him, what it means to have a relationship. This is what Jesus did for you, and he's telling all this incredible stuff, and now he's going to say, what are you going to do with it? This is almost kind of like an invitation that Paul gives us to something absolutely amazing and incredible that's almost indescribable, which is why he had to spend seven whole chapters describing it. It's kind of like this. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, this last week, our kids got to do something really fun. They got to go to a theme park called Dollywood with their grandparents. Anybody ever heard of Dollywood? Anybody ever been there? A couple people have been there. Okay. I've never been there, but apparently it's awesome. Uh, they had a lot of fun. My, my youngest was all excited about riding roller coasters. You see, he has this need for excitement and speed in his life. And uh, he, at times, I was kind of thinking he would probably wimp out on a couple of these because we've been to like smaller roller coasters that go like 30, 40 miles an hour. And even on those, he's kind of like, and so I thought, okay, I'm not sure how this is going to go. But he got on there, and he was excited about this one called the something eagle, the wild eagle, crazy eagle, wild eagle is what it's called. And he was so excited. This is one of those that dangles, though. It goes like 180 miles an hour or something like that, and it spins, it loops, all this stuff. And he was so excited about going on this, and he went on it. He chickened out the first time, but he went on it for the day a total of five times. And so he called us back. That night when it was over, we were talking to him. Did you have fun? And guess what he wanted to talk about? The wild eagle. He started telling us about how much fun he had on this wild eagle, how it looped, how he, he chickened out the first time, but then he did it five times and how fast it went, and he was so excited about it. Then he got up the next morning. We were three hours behind. Oh, I'm sorry. Two, yeah, we were three hours behind him on Eastern time. He was on Eastern time. And so we were three hours behind him at this point because we were on the West Coast. And he was like calling us. It was like five o'clock our time. He's like, hey, did I tell you guys I rode the wild eagle? <laughs> yes, you told us that you rode the wild eagle. We get it. It was fun. It was fast. He's like, yeah, I just wanted you to know that I rode it five times. Okay, we got it. Then we're, we're on our way to pick them up Friday night, and he calls uh, Jessica's phone, and he's like, hey, do you guys remember that ride that I told you about the wild eagle? Yes, buddy, we remember the wild eagle. You rode it how many times? Five. That's right. Does it loop? Absolutely it does. Then 30 minutes later, he FaceTimes me as we're driving to pick them up to say, you know what? Just stop what you're doing in the car and YouTube the wild eagle so you can see what it's like. It's like, buddy... We get it. You like the wild eagle. Then we get there, and guess what he wanted to talk about? No, why would you assume that? 
Yes, that's all he wanted to talk about. Was while they, and finally, he just stops. And he says, you know what? Here's the deal. You're just going to have to go write it for yourself. And then he said this. He said, every year on my birthday, until, we turn, until I turn 18, you're just going to have to take me to Dollywood. And there's nothing you can do or say about it. It's just happening. True story. That's what he said. So I guess every year, there's nothing I can say about it. It's going to have to happen. But this is the point where Paul does that exact same thing. He's been telling you about this incredible, amazing experience that it means to be a follower of Jesus. How it is so transformative and so special, and there's nothing like it in the world. And now it's the point where he's going to turn to every single one of his readers and say, now you need to come try this for yourself because I, it is almost in." describable and he's inviting us inviting you into this relationship with Jesus that is going to be so amazing and if there's one word that's going to describe what he's inviting you to in chapter 8 it's this word freedom everybody say freedom, freedom. come on let's say it like you mean it one two three freedom. freedom second service won't even do that good freedom and listen if there's one word that I think the world would use to describe Christianity, it probably isn't freedom, if I'm being real honest. As a matter of fact, I think that a lot of people on the outside looking in probably look at Christianity and they would say that is the opposite of freedom. Because it feels like all you got to do is follow a bunch of rules. It feels like all you got to do is make sure you do the certain things, believe a certain way, behave a certain way. Does that sound like freedom to anybody here? No, it doesn't sound like freedom because that's what the outside world looks at. But I kind of understand that that's the way that the outside world looks at following Jesus. But can I tell you guys another little secret? I believe that there are a lot of people in the church, maybe even some people sitting in this room or some people sitting on the couch watching right now, who are a part of this who don't feel free, who don't feel like Christianity should be all about freedom. And the reason is, is because we carry some weights as Jesus followers that we were never meant to carry that make us feel weighed down and matter of fact some of us fall into this thing that we would call the performance trap everybody say the performance trap the performance trap is where we feel like we have to perform a certain way in front of people and a certain way in front of God in order that God would give us his love that he would give us his grace as long as we perform and do it the right way do the things that we're supposed to do then God's going to love us these are also the kind of people that like if a tornado comes within a mile of your house you're like oh my goodness God what did I do that you would send this tornado to warn me right because it's all about my performance and if I'm performing well then God's loving me me if I'm not performing well then God doesn't love me and a lot of Christians fall fall into this performance trap and equally as important and kind of closely related to the performance trap is the pretending trap everybody say the pretending trap the pretending trap is where you try to pretend that everything's okay this is where you put on a really good show for people. This is like that family that shows up to church every Sunday morning. They're all dressed up. They match. They've all got like their lavender Bibles and everything looks great. But on the way into church, they were yelling and screaming at each other. The mom was swinging into the back seat, spanking the kids, right? But on the outside, everything looks great. But on the inside of their soul, there's just chaos. I've heard it illustrated this way. You ever, you ever in a pool try to push a beach ball down under the water? Anybody ever try to do that? And what is that beach ball trying to do the whole time you got it under the water? It's trying to come up, right? It's resisting. And, and you can look good while you're doing it for a while and nobody sees the beach ball, but it's, it's fighting you. And then what happens every now and then when you can't control that? It pops up and it makes a big splash and it, it's, it's tall, it's big, and then you got to try to grab it again and put it back down. That's kind of what the pretending trap does to us. It's like we try to push down the sin in front of people. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want it to, to change. We don't want to change. So what we do is we just pretend that everything is okay. We push it down like we're pushing down a beach ball, but every now and then what's going to happen when you are just playing the pretending game? It's going to come out and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be rough. And so uh, the, the performance trap, the pretending trap, the parent trap, whatever it is, that's a movie, it has nothing to do with this. But, that's, but whatever it is, listen, we are meant to not carry certain weights that we try to carry. God wants you to experience freedom in your life. 
that's the way he designed this, and that's the way that it's supposed to work. I, I, I thought really hard. It was a late night for us, um, but I thought really hard. You guys ever seen the movie Braveheart? It's all about freedom. I was going to paint Scott. Yeah, freedom. I was going to paint Scott's face half blue in honor of this this morning, but we just ran out of time. And uh, if you don't know the reference to that, you've had like 30 years to, to watch it. So that's kind of on you. Paul wants you to experience freedom. And the way that he's going to tell you to experience this freedom is, is actually two things. And it's kind of two sides of the same coin. And these things have to always be experienced together. And if they're not experienced together, it doesn't really work. Now, throughout history, a lot of denominations, a lot of theologians have tried to lean one way or the other on this. And they only focus on one side of the coin or the other side of the coin. But unless you have both sides of this kind of two-headed coin together, it's just not going to work. And Paul's going to explain in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, what one side of the coin means. And then he's going to spend the next few verses explaining what the second side of the coins mean. But both are equally important. Do you hear me on this? Both are equally important. If you truly want to experience freedom in your life as Jesus would have you to experience it, both sides are equally important. So if you have your Bible, flip over to Romans chapter 8, second greatest chapter in the Bible. And we're going to read, start with just verse 1. And verse 1 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you should have stood up and clapped at that one. Not for me, but because of what Paul wrote. Because this is one of the greatest verses in the entire Bible. Matter of fact, this is part of Paul's answer. Do you remember what he talked about in chapter 7? About all the struggle, the issues, and I told you that the answer was that Jesus came into this world and did his thing. Well, this is kind of Paul's continuation of that answer. The reason that he doesn't have to worry about the struggle anymore is because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? That means that you've put your trust, your faith completely in him, and you are all in on that with your life. That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. Now, this word condemnation, anybody like that word? That is a, like, think of like a courtroom word. And if you are condemned, that means that you have done something worthy of paying a price for. There is a penalty out on you, and you've got to pay the consequences. You've got to pay the penalty. You've got to pay the price for what you have been condemned for. Everybody with me on that thought process? Okay, so here's what Paul is going to tell you about Jesus. If you are in him, you've put your trust and your hope and your faith in him, then you are not condemned anymore, not because of what you've done, but because Jesus already paid the price of your condemnation. And you know what some of us try to do? We try to carry the weight of that condemnation on our shoulders. We try to pay it again, as if Jesus wasn't effective when he paid for it. We try to carry it with us, thinking we've got to earn back, pay it back when Jesus already paid for it. Listen to me. If you don't feel free in your life, maybe it's because you're carrying a weight that you were never supposed to carry. Because Jesus' death and resurrection paid the penalty for your condemnation. Were you guilty? Oh yes, absolutely, you were guilty, but Jesus already paid for it, so why would you keep trying to pay for it again? You aren't supposed to carry that weight. He paid for your past sins, your future sins, everything. Matter of fact, all of your sins when he paid for it were future sins, to be clear. He paid for all of them. You don't have to worry about that because there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. I can see that you're not as excited as you should be. Maybe you're even confused, so let me try to explain it this way. Uh, how many of you enjoy your air conditioner this time of year here in southern Alabama? Okay, good. Here's what I have found to be true uh, in multiple marriage counseling sessions. Two people are often married to each other, or at least there's always one of these types of people in a household. There's always the person this time of year that likes to keep the air set on about 77 degrees because they don't want to pay a high electric bill, right? So they say, you know what? We can turn on the fans. We can, we can go get in the pool. We can go to Lowe's. They keep the air conditioning on in there pretty low. 
but we're, we're going to keep our house at 77 degrees, 76 degrees, and that's just the way it is. Anybody like that in the room today? A couple of us. I'm kind of that way. But then you've all, uh, three, three of us, then you've also got, you've also got the people on the other side, and they're typically married to the person that likes to keep it on 77, where this person likes to keep it on 65 degrees during the summer. And they say, you know what, if it's hot outside, I'm going to be cool when I get inside, and I'm going to make sure that everybody that walks in here feels like they need a hoodie on. That's how cold I want it. Is there anybody like that in the room today? Okay, a couple of you, and a couple of you must be in between somewhere because you're just not participating in the vote. Well, here's what, what if the electric company called and they said your bill is due and the person that likes to keep it at 77 degrees pays the $500 electric bill for that month. And then the next week, the electric company calls back and they talk to the person that likes to keep it at 65 degrees in the house. And they say, we recognize that your spouse paid it already, but it was you that kept the, bill at 65, uh, kept the air at 65. So we're going to need you to be the one to pay for the $500 air conditioning bill. What would you say to the AC company at that point? I'll wait. I got time. You would say... No, we already paid it. We're not paying it again. We are a family unit. We're not paying it again just because you want to punish me for it, right? You get that when it comes to air conditioning bills, but we don't get that when it comes to Jesus because it's the exact same thing. It would be like you saying, I have to pay for my sin when Jesus already paid for it once. You don't have to do that. You have been told by Paul that if you want to experience freedom, that comes when you recognize that Jesus already paid for your condemnation. You don't have to carry it with you any longer. It is not yours. Don't put it on your shoulders if you want to have freedom in your life. You with me? That's the first side of this coin but there's a second side of this coin if the first side is that jesus paid the penalty for my sin and if i want to be free i have to recognize that jesus paid the penalty for my sin so i don't have to pay the penalty for my sin what's the other side of the coin well paul's going to start talking to us about the presence and the power of the holy spirit in our lives and he's going to start talking about how when you were in the flesh, and let me explain what he means by that. When, he's, when he says that, what he's trying to say is that when you were trying to, and he's talking to the Jews specifically, when you were trying in your own power to earn your way to God, we've talked about that a lot over the last few weeks, when, he's, when you were that way, um, it, it, just, it didn't work. When, when you lived that way, um, it brought condemnation and death to you. But now there's a new law at work. And maybe the word law is a little confusing. Maybe there's a new principle at work. You are no longer controlled by the law. Now you are controlled by or you are subject to the Holy Spirit in your life, which is going to be very different. It's like a whole different principle. It's a whole different thing. Here's how he says it. He says, because... Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, that's the one that we've been talking about, who gives life, has set you free. There's our word, freedom. Has set you free from the law of sin and death. So this one law was at work within you before Jesus. That law said that you had to earn your way to God. You had to keep the law. And if you did it good enough, if you performed well enough, then you earned your way there. Paul says you have been set free from that. That is no longer who you are. Now who you are is a person who has invited the Holy Spirit into your life. And when you invite the Holy Spirit into your life, He is now your guide, your leader, your help, your strength, sometimes your convictor. And He will guide you and lead you in the direction that you are supposed to go if you will open yourself up to Him. The first side of the coin is this. The first side is that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. The second side now is that the Holy Spirit gives you power to overcome sin in your life. And these two things always, how often? Always have to go together. If you say that, you know what? I feel like I'm forgiven 
And I feel like that's going really well, but I don't really want to transform or change anything. You might want to question whether or not you were ever fully forgiven because always when you experience the grace and the mercy of Jesus in your life, it's going to lead to transformation in your life. And the Holy Spirit is always going to lead you to righteous actions in your life from that point forward. Paul goes on over the next few verses. He says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit so we are no longer living that old life you following me you're no longer living according to the flesh anymore where you're living according to the spirit of god which dwells inside of you which is your leader your help your guide your strength and he produces a righteousness in you that you cannot produce on your own those two things always go together and paul says you are no longer trying to on your own earn your way to god he says there has been a burden that you have placed on yourself of trying to produce righteous actions over and over and over again. Do you remember that story in John chapter 8 where Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman and she's been caught in adultery? And, you know, it, she was caught in adultery with a man. And according to the Jewish law, both the man and the woman were supposed to be stoned at that point and not recreationally speaking, like they were going to grab rocks and hit, throw them at them until they died. But they only brought the woman before Jesus because they didn't care about the man they were trying to make a point here which was wrong but they brought this woman before Jesus and you know what he told her he told her I don't condemn you that was the first thing that he said which made the the Pharisees in the crowd that made them angry because they were like, but she did something worthy of condemnation that's right she did but Jesus knew that he had to start with this whole idea that she was no longer condemned and then you know what he told her to do next? Say it loud, somebody. Go and sin no more. He says, now, I want you to understand, first and foremost, you don't carry the weight of condemnation, even though you deserve it anymore. I carry that for you. You're forgiven. But secondly, and always accompanied with it, now go and sin no more. It was absolutely amazing. Other times, matter of fact, there, there were so many times in the Gospels that Jesus would have this conversation with people. He would walk up to a person who was like laying on the side of the street because they couldn't walk and they were begging for money and they would hear about Jesus and they would beg Jesus to heal them. And what's the first thing that Jesus would say to those people? Your sins are forgiven, right? He, want, he asked one person, do you, want, do you want to be healed? But he would say, your sins are forgiven. And that person's like, well, that's great, but that's not really what I'm asking for. Then he would say, now get up and walk. But it always started with you don't carry the burden of your sin anymore. Now you got to start walking. And I think what Paul was saying to the church in Rome, and I think what he's saying to us is, are you carrying a weight that is keeping you from the freedom that you're supposed to experience in Jesus? Because if you want to experience freedom in Jesus, here's how you do it. Take the weight of condemnation off your shoulders. Take the weight of the law off your shoulders. Put it on Jesus. Put it on the Holy Spirit and let them lead you. He goes on to say this. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And what in the world does that mean? Well, the, what does the Holy Spirit desire? That's exactly the look I was expecting from you. What does the Holy Spirit desire? That's a tough question. What is God? God? The Holy Spirit is God. The person, not just some mystical thing out there. It's not the force. It doesn't show up as like Obi-Wan Kenobi beside you. It's, it's God. The Holy Spirit desires God's glory. The Holy Spirit desires truth. The Holy Spirit desires justice. The Holy Spirit desires love displayed among God's people. What if, what if you set your mind on the things that the Holy Spirit wants and you make them the things that you want? You want God's glory. You want God's truth. You want love among God's people. What if you set your heart on those things? 
That's how you let the Spirit lead you, according to Paul. You are aware of His presence in your life. And then it goes on, verse 6, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. What does it mean to have a mind that is governed by the flesh? Again, that's the exact way I thought you would look. They tell us that there are five things that you can use to determine whether your mind is governed by the flesh or governed by the spirit. You want to hear them? All right, so I'll tell you. There are five things, five self things that you can look at. Number one is self-will versus God's will. Is it about what I want? in life or is it about what God wants for me secondly is it self-glory or is it God's glory am I in it for myself or am I in it to please God self-gratification or do I live to please God the father self-righteousness am I all about myself or am I about God's righteousness and number five self-sufficiency or do I rely on God in my life Number nine, verse nine, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So he tells them, you have to be different. There has to be a transformation. You can't keep on doing the things that you were doing before and expect it to work. That's not the way it works anymore. Now, the Holy Spirit guides you, leads you to something completely different in your life. And then he goes on, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Okay, I know that that was a bit complicated. Let me, let me try to wrap it up in a way that you'll understand here, the way that we'll all understand. If you want to experience, what's our word for today? Freedom in your life. You've got to lay down some things. It's not a choice. It's not a, something that you get to continue to carry and also experience freedom. You've got to lay it down. Number one, you've got to lay down the weight of condemnation in your life. You've got to lay it down. You cannot carry it and experience freedom. Some of you are carrying it still. You're trying to pay for the sins that Jesus already paid for. you got to lay it down. The second thing is you cannot continue to live as if life is like this. You cannot continue to live as the Christian life is not a gradual self-improvement. It's learning to live in step with the Spirit. You cannot just continue to try to say, you know what, I'm just going to do a little bit better this year. This year I'm going to eliminate one sin from my life. Next year I'll eliminate another one. You, it, it's not some gradual self-improvement plan like Dr. Phil trying to get you better. Instead, you've got to eliminate that way of thinking if you want to be free. That's not the way that we think anymore. Paul says the way that you experience freedom is you line yourself up with the Holy Spirit in your life. You are constantly aware of His presence in your life, and you trust Him him to lead you and guide you and you know how you can determine whether the holy spirit is leading you to do something or if you are leading you to do something i can wait if you are leading you to do something it might very well contradict god's word the Holy Spirit leading you to do something will never contradict god's word so if you're hungry and you feel like stealing a snickers bar that's not the holy spirit leading you right God's going to lead you towards righteousness. These two things always go together. And then, I can't tell you this is the the greatest chapter in the whole Bible and then only do 11 verses when there are 39 verses. Let me tell you what happens through a few more verses. Uh, Through the next few verses, Paul continues to tell us that it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can overcome sin in our life. I heard one pastor say that if you try to do it the other way and you continue to live in the old way, carrying that bondage on you, that it's like trying to slap a lion. Just doesn't go very well for you or the lion. Then he goes to verses 18 through 30, which he begins to talk about how in this world, even when you experience the Holy Spirit leading you in your life, there are going to be times of trial and suffering and tribulation, and you have to press through those even 
uh, even with the Holy Spirit in your life, you have to press through those. And then he gets to the final few verses where he talks about kind of the, the big reveal. This is what it means to experience true victory and freedom if you have laid down the weight of your condemnation, if you've put on the help of the Holy Spirit. This is what it says. If God can be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died more than that, who raised to life is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness. Why is that one on the list, right? Or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you want to experience freedom in your life, it is available to you. If you want to experience it, it's there. Freedom and victory are there if you will lay down the weight of your condemnation Put on the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that is the key to freedom. And you know, th- these verses that we just read, they are actually a direct comparison, a direct contrast, rather, to Psalm 44. Anybody have Psalm 44 memorized? No. Psalm 44 is a, kind of a lament about this time in Israel's life where they had fallen into deep sin. They were surrounded by their enemies and there was no way out. Freedom wasn't an option. They were about to be exiled. Here's what Paul is telling us. There are a lot of people, maybe even you, who are still living in Psalm 44 when we're supposed to be living in Romans chapter 8. And so if you're here and you're carrying the weight of condemnation in your life, This is the time that you lay it down. If you're here and you haven't submitted yourself to the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and to be constantly aware of His presence so that it can bring transformation in your life, today is the day that you should do that. Stand with me. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to God's message to you today that you don't have to carry this weight. You can experience freedom instead. And so if you're here, with everybody head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you feel like you're carrying that weight of condemnation on your shoulders, you feel like you need to pay for it, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond today. You can lay it down and accept the forgiveness of Christ in your life, maybe for the first time. If you're here today and you would say, you know what, I've never really even thought about it. I just thought that I was supposed to try to do better. And, and get out of my sin, but I've never really taken the time to think about what it means to submit myself to the Holy Spirit, to invite Him to live in me so that I could be led by His presence, by His power, and that He would bring transformation to me. You know, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you allow Him to lead you and guide you, it produces something in you. Paul says it produces fruit in you. It produces joy, love, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to do that in your life. If you've just been trying to get better, you've been carrying a weight that you were never meant to carry. You are supposed to experience a freedom that is beyond that. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond. And so take the next 30 seconds, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. If you need to lay down the weight of your condemnation, or if you need to commit yourself to inviting the Holy Spirit into your life, whatever it is, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. You can pray at your seat. You can pray at the front. You can come and talk to me afterwards. I just don't want you to leave here today without experience freedom and victory in your life. Take 30 seconds. Let the Holy Spirit speak into you.
Father, today for some of us, we lay the weight of condemnation down. We don't have to pay for it again because you already paid for it. Why would we consistently carry that with us when you died for it? And then on the flip side, Father, we also know that now that we are forgiven and that we are no longer condemned, that we are not under the same principle that we were before, Instead, we have to be guided by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit that would bring transformation and righteous living to our lives. And so if if some of us are here today and we're just trying to get a little bit better each day, God, help us to instead pause and just surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Invite Him in and let Him transform us. Let it be true of every single one of us today so that we can experience your freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody. We'll see you guys back next week for part eight. There's only two more parts, eight and nine, coming up over the next couple weeks. We'll see you guys back next Sunday.